Ah. Yeah, it's going to be a long one today, people. How you doing? I'm Taylor. It's May 10th. It's a cranky comic book review show. i got a lot of crap to go through this week, so let's do it. Worst to best. I don't know. I feel kind of bad. And I'm going to have to turn off my messenger because somebody's messaging me while I'm recording these goddamn sons of bitches. Anyways, this is a book I kind of feel bad about, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. It is, what is it called even? Cartoon Puppet Horror Theater, number one. It's uh, an indie book, and I uh, written, written my essay check and art by Matt Hansel. And I appreciate what it's trying to do. It's cartoony and puppety, and the art is actually kind of cute and adorable. And it's trying to like t weave together horror tropes and like Sesame Street cartoons, and it just doesn't really work. And I feel bad because I, I, I feel like I'm trashing on like, a creator who put everything they had in this book. And that's not who I want to be as a person. But I just don't think this is ready for prime time. It's, there's some nuggets here. Um, I do, like I said, I think the art is solid. And I think the idea is solid. But the execution, there's devices they use in the storytelling that I don't think work. And then there are, the story itself just isn't really very interesting and that's kind of the problem so it's on the bottom of the list but I feel like an asshole for putting it on the bottom of the list but it is what it is so I'll I'll recover from my asshole list and move on to mainstream DC where I feel like I said asshole for whatever reason it's still creators making things and putting their all into it but now they're getting paid maybe a little more so anyways spirit world number one uh dawn of DC Alyssa Wong and Haining and yeah, this book also just isn't what you'd call good. It just does not really have an interesting story. And the story that they're, they are telling is not super clear. Uh, there are just parts where I was like, what the hell's going on here? Like, it shifts between, like, this character, who I don't know if everyone really gets a name, Xantha, I think, and Batgirl, and then a really watered-down, wussified John Constantine. And uh, it just doesn't work very well. Uh, and, and, like... Parts of it they're using the art to tell a story, but when they do that, it's not clear either. I'm a firm believer of show, don't tell. But when you show it, you got to make sure you're really showing it, if you know what I mean. No, it just doesn't. I didn't like this one. Um, I won't be f following up on it. It was a first issue thing. The Dawn of DC books, I think, have like six proven issues, and if they work well, then they get more. And you know, maybe your mileage might vary. It's at least a new property for DC in a unique direction. But it just is kind of boring, so it is what it is. And another one I'm going to feel, I mean, I'm just going to feel bad today, people. It's how, I, it's how I'm going to roll. So we have Something Epic by Simon Kudronsky. And Simon Kudronsky is doing everything on this except for the lettering. Um, and it's been translated. Okay, so um, that might make sense of some of this. So the lettering is DC Hopkins. Um, it's, a, it's an image book. And... It's gorgeous. Like, the art in here is fantastic. I mean, there's it's moody. It's dark. I can't tell if it's digitally illustrated or not. I'm going to lean towards yes. That's my guess. Yeah, actually, yeah, it probably is. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's digitally illustrated. But, um, and the premise is pretty interesting. It's this kid who can see imaginary creatures as if they're real. And they might be. It's not really made clear in this. It's just really verbose. As you can see, here's lots of uh, righty-talky bits. There's homage paid to, like, characters. You know, you get a like, Scooby-Doo, you get whatever, Dragon Balls, or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's just, there's not much of a story at all. It's just kind of an info dump of a first issue. And then at the end, there's, like, maybe a little bit of a revelation, but not really. And it's paced weirdly, and, like, the story's on the back cover. It's just a... It, it needed either a different translator or to have more than one issue put together in one or... A different beginning to the issue, like something storytelling wise, where it's just there's more of a spark to actually the, kick off the story, have the story, and then explain what's going on. This is all explainy and no story, and it's just kind of boring. So, all right, speaking of kind of boring, <laughs> I know I'm in a mood today too, so I feel bad, but I'm in a mood. I'm fucking, I'm all torn and con conflicted. Green Lantern number one, also just kind of goddamn boring. Like, the, the Jerry Adams are uh, writing the main Hal Jordan story. It's not, Hal Jordan's back, but not in an interesting way, and not doing anything really interesting. 
Um, you find out like why I guess he's back. I mean, I'm not been following up in the past ever of Green Lantern really. I know he was gone. I know all the lanterns are depowered or some shit, or Earth is off limits or whatever. So the way that the Green Lantern comes back is kind of nonsensical. Uh, and then, like, it just feels like it's touching on every single Hal Jordan trope. Like, even if it's not a regular reader of Hal Jordan, I know all the tropes. The Willbauer, the Jet Fighter, the, the Brash, the Arrogant, you get all that shit. What you don't get is anything fucking <laughs> exciting. The backup story by uh, Phil, uh, Phil Kennedy Johnson uh, with John Stewart, I like a little bit better. Not much better, but a bit better. It's got, uh, who's the art by in the backup? Hang on. Art is by, no, that's not it. That's not it either. Uh, who's the art by? Okay, damn it. They don't just put the art in the first fucking Jesus Christ. Um, Montos. All right, whatever. Uh, the the the, the backup story is setting up to be more of a horror story, featuring John John uh, John Stewart. And like I, I'm digging some of the art. It's still set up, but also it's only like eight pages to work with versus the whole main uh, Green Lantern boring hot nonsense. So yeah, um, I'd rather just read the Green Lantern. Or the John Stewart story, and be done with it. Uh, I don't think I'll be continuing with this one either. It just didn't do much for me, like like at all, 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 at all. At all. Yeah, words are hard today. All right, next we have a clear number three, and look, is that reflecting? Anyway, clear number three. This is the end. Uh, Scott Snyder and uh, Francis Manipal. I really enjoyed this series up until now. Like, it was, I believe it's a comicology digital first kind of thing. I think so. Um, it's a $6 book too, kind of expensive, but you get a ton of book for it. You get like, I believe two digital issues because this is saying like, see, there's a, there's an editing thing in here where it says see issue number four, but I'm pretty sure they're talking about last issue, which is number, issue number two. Confusing as much. I get all that. But, um, the idea is like people are in the future wear these like veils to not see reality and they're called veils or whatever. And this main character's going clear because he's trying to solve his wife's murder and he's sad and he's all that. And then it turns matrixy in a way that's like pretty predictable. Um, it, Manipal's art is great. Um, actually, I like the art better in the first two issues. It's, it is still good. It's very solid and well-designed and there's some gorgeous pages in here. I just felt this was a pretty severe drop-off in the first two. And I, it, it didn't stick the landing for me at all. It just kind of like turned into like, yeah, okay, that's about what I thought it'd be. Um, there's some moments there where it's like, where Scott Steiner does manage to sort of surprise you a little bit, but in a world where nothing is, is, is what it seems and the protagonist is thinking he's seeing what he's thinking, like what's the real world, if I could just tell you that, you could probably figure out the trick or whatever, the quote-unquote trick that Steiner uses in this, and it's, pr mm. I was just kind of like, oh, yeah, okay, that's what he did. Yep, all right, that's about right, okay. Moving on. Next, we have Nemesis. Nemesis Reloaded, issue number five. The last issue of this one. You're going to see a theme here. There's a lot of last issues that I don't think really stuck the landing. Now, the Nemesis is a weird one. It's Mark Miller and Jorge Jimenez. The art is fantastic. Jorge Jimenez is baller on the art. And the main story where Nemesis wraps it up, fairly predictable, but still pretty damn solid. Like, it's, like, brutal and and Mark Millery and over the top and, like, in a, almost a guard in this kind of way. And you get the gorgeous art here. What happens, though, is, like, Miller is, like, all of a sudden weaving in this other shit. Like, this supernaturally comic booky stuff. And there's a reason why he's doing it, and you'll find out the reason. But I don't like the reason. And it just felt really shoehorned in here. It's sort of like, okay, that... None of that should have been in this book. It should have been its own separate thing. Uh, and then it could have been a, just kind of a brutal, tight, like, parody slash homage to Batman in the in the quote-unquote real world and been done with it. But this other B story that got tied into this, it just really was, like, bugged me a bit. I was like, I don't... Why? 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 Just make that its own separate thing. You, you put out 14 books a month anyways, Miller. Just fucking do it separately. Anyways. Moving on. Oh, hey, another Mark Miller book. I didn't even realize, like, I, I stacked these in order without really thinking, trying to think about who wrote them or whatever. And anyway, next, we're getting better, though. Um, we're starting to get into the better section of things. So this is Mark Miller and Pepe Larraz and um, this, or no, not Pepe Miller, or Oliver Claypool, um, Ambassadors number four. I missed issue number three. And this whole thing is a, the, the World Corporation is deciding six people or seven people or whatever, one from each continent, something like that. We're going to get superpowers, and, like, you know, the mysterious lady decides who's worthy. That's the setup. It's the first issue, if you, you know, whatever. 
Um, and this is Brazil. And it's an interesting setup. And the, the art is pretty gritty and kind of fun and dark. And it's got some drug cartel -y stuff. I don't want to give away the whole plot. And there is a twist, because it's, it's Mark Miller. You would not have a twist. You wouldn't have a Mark Miller book without there being a twist. However, this twist I actually liked. It's not earth-shattering, not a like, oh, well, okay, not, not the craziest. But I think it's a fun one, and it could lead to fun dynamics if this book continues and actually does something other than building the team, the ambassadors. If it's just a team-building book, then it's just going to be like, okay, we got the team, now what? Um, and, yeah, again, I'm missing number three, but so far I think they're all kind of self-contained, and I'll find issue number three. And then there is a little bit of setup for, like, the potential for there actually to be some kind of conflict other than just setting up new superheroes every issue. So, I have hope. I have hope, people. I have hope. All right. Noctera, another Scott Snyder book. This next. Scott Noctera, number 14. Tony Daniel, Scott Snyder. Uh, the world's dark. There's a light city. <laughs> this is getting all kind of mystical and, like, philosophical in this one as far as, like, the reasons why there's, like, a haven. Like, we're that kind of in that, that point in the series. And uh, there's arguments through made. It's kind of a calm issue for the most part. Uh, again, there's a thing at the end, because it wouldn't be Scott Snyder without a thing at the end. And uh, it's not the end of the series, but it, it, but it does feel like it's the start of the next chapter. And in fact, it even says, like, you have a backstory here a little bit, and then I think it even, like, I think, it, yeah. Look, the new chapter, which is a little weird, because it's about eight pages in. It feels a little weirdly divided, but it, it could have just started with the, <laughs> the new chapter part, but I get it, then intro. So this feels like the beginning of the next chapter of Noctera. I don't know if they're going to break. I, it also kind of feels like they might be, uh, which I hope not. I, I kind of like reading this monthly. I think it reads better when you just get it every month because it's kind of a fast-paced, not crazy deep, kind of ridiculous concept. Like the world is dark. They need lights, and if you don't have lights, there's monsters. So that's, that's the concept. Uh, but it's fun. It's, it's, it's better than the other stuff below the list. Maybe this won't be a short, that long a video. I'm going pretty quickly. I don't know why. I don't know. I need some dinner. And all right, next. This was, if you watch Two Hot Guys, One Pick, or Two Girls, One Cup, whatever the hell it's called. I can't remember. Uh, Chris the Comic Vet and uh, Mark Legion of Comics have this thing every week where they do Two Hot Guys, One Pick. That's Two Cool Guys, One Pick? That's what it is. <laughs> and they asked, they have their 100th episode, and they asked people to pick their picks for the week. And so this was my pick of the week. It's not my favorite book of the week, but it's my pick of the week. Uh, Junkyard Joe... Number six. This is the last issue of Junkyard Joe. Written by Jeff Johns and Gary Frank. It's about a, a war robot made to fight in, I believe, the Vietnam War. They don't, I don't think they really specify by which war. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then this is the ending of the saga. Because the, the robot's been peaceful and found another person that was in the platoon he served in back in the day. Who's now a cartoonist named Muddy Waters. Muddy Waters is living a peaceful life but also traumatized by the history of war and like the robot is also traumatized by the, the war. So it, it's interesting. Um, it is a solid ending. Uh, and Gary Frank's art is great. And, like, it does wrap it up, up effectively. Um, it, it's pretty predictable in, in the ending. Uh, and it's fairly saccharine. Uh, for kids nowadays, no kids are watching this. It's like fake, it's like sugary sweet ending, kind of. And I, that's the part I don't love. I think it was still a solid way to wrap up the story and it made sense story-wise so i'm not really dinging it too much but i was hoping for a little more um i probably should have known better it's jeff johns and he doesn't really give too much more than you think normally i mean i've been pleasantly surprised by this series up until now and this is just kind of like a like the series have gone but now it's like this it's not bad it's better than the other endings this week so far but uh it's still not fantastic it's just kind of like a, okay that's the ending and I get it. And, like, it's also pretty, like, pretty much what you could, what you would expect. Oh, so. Um, oh, I guess, hang on. Junkyard Joe, they have a timeline. 1972. So, there's a timeline. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't read the back, back ephemera, uh, whatever. I was too busy, to, you know, trying to figure out my incoherent thoughts for this rambling video. Yeah, decent. Not, not amazing. All right, next. Uh, we have Saga. The number, what is this, 64? Something like that. I don't even know. 64. I, I, this is a hard one to review every week. If you like Saga, you're going to like this. If you've never read Saga, don't start here. It's Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples. They're telling an odd, a, a dramatic, you know, 100 some issue space opera where 64 is into this, issues into the space opera. There are plans afoot to capture the heroes who are on the run 
and it's a space opera. It's I love it, uh, but it's sort of like tuning into a, like an old radio show halfway through it, or like a um, like an episode of Lost, like in season three, without having to watch first three or any any kind of that serial television. If you if you've not watched the first couple, like you're not going to get it, and it's because of the nature of how this thing's told. Like you're not getting necessarily like there's always Brian K. Vaughan's great at setting up like there's there's the beat at the end setting up the next issue and then the the issue the next issue starts with another a nice beat like he's very good at telling monthly comics but in the middle then you have like okay just what's been going on in the lives and like moving the plot forward and that's what this book does very well is it moves the plot forward but this is not a resolution in any means or way or sense it's just kind of like an episode in the middle of the season so it's a good one just hard to talk about. All right, next we have Phantom Road number three. This is uh, Jeff Lemire and Gabriel Walta with uh, Jordi Belair on the colors. And this is Jeff Lemire doing weird ass horror shit. Or not quite horror stuff, but not quite not horror stuff. There's a Phantom Road. There's two travelers on the road. And there's people after them. There's a murder, maybe. Um, and then Gabriel Walta's art, I love. It's kind of blocky and bizarre, uh, but at the same time, very clear and easy to see. Just kind of nicely laid out and like block, like I said, gridded. Like it's it's always clear. You're never at a loss what's going on. And I can't show you that page. Uh, and there's some gorgeous like spreads in here. It's just this is like middle of the series, and it's a lot of atmosphere. If you're expecting a, a, a book from Lemire that's not that, you're probably reading the wrong art writer too, because that's what he's really good at. He's really good at setting up. Like a kind of creepy atmosphere to a book, and that's that's this. Um, it's the plot for what it is. There's not a ton in this one, but I'm digging it. And yeah, I'm I'm along for the ride. I don't know how many issues this one is going to be. You can probably find the back issues fairly cheaply, or just wait for a trade on it. But yeah, I'm liking it. Phantom Road number three. There's something about a weird truck stop too. So take that for what it's worth. All right, next we're coming towards the end, people. And I did not expect this one to be this high on the list. I thought, well. Because the last couple have been fine, but the, we're getting towards the end of the list of my stack for the week. And also, Daredevil. It's wrapping up. Chip Zdarsky's run is ending. This is uh, number 11. I don't know how many issues are left, but there can't be many. Maybe two or three. We're racing towards the end game, and this feels like it. It's Raphael de, Torre, de la Torre on art instead of uh, Jorge him. And it, no, is it Jorge Menes? No. Who is, I can't remember who was doing the art on this before. It's a good substitute. It's nice and like kind of still wiry and like still daredevil y. I, I just can't, not, he was not been the main artist on this, and I can't think of who was because I'm having a brain fart. But this book, even though it's kind of in the middle and we're not at the end game yet, it's got some, <laughs> it's got some badass daredevil moments in it. It's got what you want out of daredevil. Like it's got the religious guilt. It's got some, like Matt Murdock messing it all up and down in his luck. And then it's got him doing some crazy ass shit just to be like, well, I'm going to try the crazy-ass shit to see if that works. Um, it's There's a page where it's like, ooh, wow, okay, he did that. Um, and and like the ending where you're like, well, okay, that's not, that's kind of new for Daredevil's mentality, at least. So there's an ending in here that's like, fits with the Daredevil character, and also is like, okay, that's a little bit different than anything I've ever read before. So I'm digging that. I'm liking how this is going. It, it, there was a lull in the Zdarsky run, but I think now we're back on top and we're, we're heading towards the super duper finish line. Plus, I love that Daredevil costume. Not this, not not this page. The Scarlet Witch that's different, but look at that Daredevil in the shadows of the hood. I like the hooded Daredevil look. It's, it's pretty fucking baller. So Daredevil number eleven. Yeah, and then all right, this is cheating, and I don't give a shit. It's my channel. I can cheat if I want to. This came out on Free Comic Day. You can probably find stacks of this at your LCS because I got a feeling it wasn't very highly picked up. But this is my favorite book of the week. It's uh, Fish Flies by Jeff Lemire. Now, this is all Jeff Lemire, so you get his, like, really inky, blocky character faces. You get his set in the northern small town. You get teenagers not getting along. You get everyone giving each other a little bit of shit, and then you get a weird happening. I mean, it's, you could probably, there, there's like the Lemire beats that are present and in and, and a lot of his writing. And this is touching on it. But it's in a new way. And I, there's a few things where you're like, what the hell? How is that getting there? Like you know, there's, there's pages, there's grossness, there's fish flies. And I love it when Lemire draws himself. Not, not self-portraits, but I love it when he draws his own writing. 
It's like does the whole comic stuff. It's because because it just fits. And uh, I think either you can get this for free, or I'm guessing it'll be re reproduced to buy from Image. So I probably would actually buy the first one if I have it too. But I mean, it's just like if you like Hit Linear's watercolor stuff and you like Linear's writing, pick it up. Or if you want to be a cheap bastard and you've never read Linear, you could probably hunt this down and figure out if it's for you. It's not going to be for everybody. It's not like. If you're giant into Marvel superhero shit and like like that kind of stuff, this is not probably going to be your jam unless you want something different. But I love Lemire, and I don't love everything he's done. Like I don't like the little monsters quite a whole lot and stuff. But like Sweet Tooth, uh, Essex County, uh, Underwater Welder. Like he's got a very solid body of work, and uh, Gideon Falls, uh, the Black Hammer series, and I think this ad is going to add to it if this is any indication. So pick it up for free. I give it a whirl, and uh, yeah, that's what I got. That's my uh, list this week. Did I miss anything? Probably. Let me know. Um, do you rank things differently? Let me know in the comments. Interact, and, and I don't know, whatever you do, just don't be a dick. Even, even if you're kind of hungry. And I'm going to get some tacos or some shit. See ya.